long time. It's the story of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's been almost 30 years since his death, and still the circumstances surrounding his death seem no clearer today than they did that November day in Dallas. Over the years, dozens of theories attempted to explain the killing and the investigation. But now, after decades of silence, a doctor who actually witnessed Kennedy's death takes us back to that fateful day. And he shows us why he thinks there was more than one assassin and why there was a cover-up to conceal that fact. From the moment it occurred, the death of President John F. Kennedy has been one of the greatest political mysteries of our times. And in almost 30 years since the assassination, we seem no closer to learning the Kennedy truth about that infamous day in Dallas. John F. Kennedy's murder was probably one of the most terrible moments in the history of our country. The release of controversial films like JFK and more recently Ruby have further clouded the issue by mixing fact and fiction. But now, for the first time since Kennedy's death, one of the doctors who fought to save the president's life is talking about what he saw. The wounds that I personally saw were the small anterior entrance wound here in the throat and the large avulsive hole in the right part of the back, including part of the parietal, the temple, and all of the occipital bones. The only thing I can, can tell you from my personal observations and those pictures that I viewed of the autopsy, there is definitely a difference. I think I can comment that there was the attempt at a cover-up to not let the American public know that he was shot from the front. Dr. Charles Crenshaw was a third-year resident on the trauma team at Parkland Hospital in Dallas during the early 1960s. In November of 63, a phone call would summon Crenshaw to become not only a witness to history, but part of it as well. We were going through a normal day in a surgical residency. However, this was going to be a holiday to me. The president was coming to Dallas. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see them. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. I picked up the phone, and the uh, telephone operator said, the president's been shot. And she was an older lady who left a kid with the residents. We had no pagers then, no page, only the page system. So she said, this is no joke. The president's been shot, and he's coming to the back door. We've received reports here at Parkland that Governor Connolly was shot in the upper left chest, and the first unconfirmed reports say the president was hit in the head. We go into the emergency room. It's sheer bedlam. People were running everywhere. Um, the CIA or the F Secret Service people, the FBI, no one knew each other. And I ran by uh, the, the nursing desk in the center of the emergency room. The nurse was crying and held up one, which meant that the president was in trauma room one. And that's when we walked into it. With the President of the United States mortally wounded and stretched out before him, Dr. Crenshaw could see his medical team was fighting a losing battle. Kennedy was dying, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. The President um, was agonal when he arrived. He had no blood pressure. There might have been a pulse, but not really. So there we were. We had gone through the ABCs, and we were deciding to, are trying to see if there was a spark of life. And the president's uh, heart action was failing. At that time, all of us, um, we'd trained all our lives um, to take care of trauma. That's what we were noted for in Dallas. And here is the most prominent person in the civilized world and we weren't able to save him. It was a terrible, terrible feeling. President Hoffman, John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain.
Well, you know, after we had completed our procedures, I went up uh, for the first time to see the head wound, and it was ghastly. The bullet had come in, gone through the parietal, some of the temporal, and occipital, and out. And below that, the cerebellum. This is a small part of the brain that is protected by the cerebral hemispheres. And all of this brain tissue was gone. This was a huge cavity. And then I knew there would have been, there was no hope at all. I briefly saw the uh, wound before, but then I knew. After personally witnessing the death of a president and the grieving of his widow, Dr. Crenshaw had one more duty to perform, preparing the body for what he thought would be an immediate autopsy. But that was not to be. The body was taken back to Washington before an autopsy could be performed. However, before the president's body was removed, Dr. Crenshaw had one more chance to study the nature of the president's wounds. I felt we were going to have an autopsy. In the state of Texas, you always have an autopsy. Uh, you have to have one. That's a state law. Uh, but I would proceed with what I should do to get him to where the autopsy would be performed. And just before that, I got to see the anterior wound here again. And I saw the, the head wound again closely. And I looked in the back of the scalp. I didn't look at the back. I didn't know there was another wound there. So I looked entirely at the head. And we placed a large, um, it was a plain mattress cover, plastic mattress cover, over the head. And then we lifted and put the president, John Kennedy, into the coffin. And if they had not bent the rules and broken the laws, we would not have this mystery today. The whole handling of this assassination has created doubt in the American people. Even though he fought to save a dying president, Dr. Crenshaw's place in history wasn't completely written. Two days later, as the nation mourned its slain leader, Dr. Crenshaw would again find himself fighting to save the life of another important figure in the Kennedy assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald had been shot, and they were bringing him in to Parkland Hospital. In a rare twist of fate, Dr. Crenshaw would find himself trying to save the life of Kennedy's accused assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, next. Bullet shocked the nation. And in part one, you saw how Dr. Charles Crenshaw played a part in trying to save the president's life. And now as our story continues, you'll see how fact is indeed stranger than fiction. For Dr. Crenshaw, one irony of the Kennedy assassination is that within just two days, he again was trying to save a life. This time, though, it was the life of accused assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade group. There has been a shooting. I repeat, a shooting in the motorcade in the downtown area. The president's car is now going past me, now traveling at a very high rate of speed. Secret Service men standing up in the limousine. They are armed with submachine guns. The death of President John F. Kennedy shocked the nation. But within hours of his assassination, a suspect had been captured. Lee Harvey Oswald, an employee of the book depository where the shots were said to have come from, was described as the lone assassin. Law enforcement officials had their man. It was an open and shut case as far as the public knew, and the American people were left to grieve for and bury their slain leader. For the first time, TV is going all night there in Dallas for the first time, and the first time I even saw pictures of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. But nevertheless, the real effect is I went back to work the next day. And we were sitting in the coffee room, in the residence lounge there. And obviously, you know what we were talking about. And the telephone rang, and we picked up the phone, and it was the uh, administrator of Parkland Hospital. And he demanded a, an operating team to come down to the emergency room. Do you have anything to say in your defense? Oh, Oswald has been shot. Lee Harvey Oswald had been shot, and they were bringing him in to Parkland Hospital. And that was almost unbelievable. 
However, he was then coming in, and we were preparing trauma room one, and one of the few things that Jack Price always remembers was that I told him that we could not have the accused assassin in trauma room one. Therefore, we treated Oswald when he arrived in trauma room two. Incredibly, just two days after he fought to save the life of a dying president, Dr. Charles Crenshaw found himself doing the same thing for the man accused of killing Kennedy. But that wasn't the only unusual thing to happen that day. A few minutes after Oswald was taken to surgery, Dr. Crenshaw was called to the phone once more to speak with the new president of the United States. And I picked up the telephone and said, this is Dr. Crenshaw. And all of a sudden, like a voice out of thunder, said, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. How is the accused assassin doing? I said, well, he's critical. He's lost an enormous amount of blood. He is holding his own, and we're doing the best we can. He said, would you take a message to the chief operating surgeon? I said, certainly. He said, I would like to have a deathbed statement from that man. Shortly thereafter, the complications of hemorrhagic shock from brain loss ensued, and Lee Harvey Oswald died. And Dallas had solved the killing of the century in hours. Everybody knew it. And the killer was Lee Harvey Oswald, and the shot were from the back. I may be naive, but I'm not crazy. Um, Things were shaping up in a way that worried me uh, that um, that a thorough investigation hadn't been done. So I think that there was at least multiple assassins. And I believe that the Warren Commission was a cover-up to meant to only allow one version that would make the American people think of only one assassin. Even though it took nearly 30 years for Dr. Crenshaw to speak out, he says he's doing so because the truth must finally be told. But he also has a new book, and there are some who say Crenshaw is just capitalizing on the death of the president. Even some of the doctors who were with him in the emergency room that day questioned Crenshaw's motives and his medical expertise at the time. But Charles Crenshaw says he knows what he saw, and he hopes talking about it will change the way history views the Kennedy assassination. The most important factor about the observation or criticism is it was not a snap judgment. I stayed there because I was low man on the totem pole taking care of the body and making sure it was ready for, I thought, the autopsy at first, and then, of course, it was for the coffin. And I got to study that, and I wanted to remember it the rest of my life. That was the exit wound in the back of his head. Dr. Crenshaw said that he waited so long because he was basically scared about jeopardizing his medical career. And even though he never really feared for his life, it was apparent to him that there was an attempt to cover up all the facts. But now at the end of his career, Dr. Crenshaw says it's finally time that the truth is known. Official versions of the truth exist in piles and piles of documents from various government groups, including the Warren Commission. And there have been even more theories that revealing the contents of those documents will somehow enlighten the nation's understanding of this tragedy. At this point, however, most of the papers won't be released until well into the next century. The mystery of John F. Kennedy's assassination is for the history books, perhaps the history books that our great-great-grandchildren will read.